All right, it's noon. We've still got some people logging in, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Mark Henriquez. I'm a partner with Wombleban Dickinson. Today, we're going to be talking about drafting document retention policies. Um, and I, let me give you, let's just jump in and I'll give you an overview of what we're going to cover, what we're going to cover today. Um, I think, you know, we're going to talk some about information governance. That's really how I came to this topic. I know some of you on the call, I know we've had over 100 register. I wish you could all see each other um, and make it more interactive. But for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm a business litigator. I uh, do a lot of e-discovery. And that's how I came to join the Sedona Conference, which has been around for a while. Many of you may know it in connection with their work around litigation hold and their changes to the federal rules, particularly around spoliation. I was very involved in that work and still do work in that area, but I got introduced to the broader field of information governance, which I found really interesting and I think becomes more and more relevant as we move to a digital age. Um, and as a result, uh, Sedona's published a number of pieces. I've got reference links to them at the end on information governance and one key component of that is drafting litigation policy. So that's how I came to this area of information governance and uh, litigation hold policies, and then the broader question of document retention policies. And so since uh, in the, over the last 10 years, I've worked with a number of clients to review those um, document retention policies, think about how to draft those, including the various stakeholders. And that's really what I want to share with you today. As always, my focus is going to try to be uh, pragmatic and practical. I do have some resources I'll be emailing to everybody that registered, including the slides, but also some sample policies. I know everyone's always interested in samples, so I've got a sample from a healthcare company, a more generic sample, a sample litigation hold, and a sample litigation hold email. Um, again, I think all those need to be customized for your individual company, but I will be circulating those, and I'll be talking about some tips about how to draft policies and what kind of things to think about uh, with your specific company. As always, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible and get your perspectives on litigation hold uh, and document retention policies. I've got some polling questions we'll get to in a little bit to increase that interaction. But I'd also love you to think about using the chat feature. You can do a chat that shares with everybody if you've got thoughts that you want to share. Uh, to make it a little more interactive since we're not all in a room uh, at Byron South End where we can see each other uh, and share a meal. Um, also, if you've got questions, there is that Q&A box. Go ahead and submit questions. I'm going to try to leave a little bit of time at the end to deal with those, but I'm also happy uh, to answer some questions as we go. So I encourage you uh, to do that as well. So again, we're going to talk about information governance, what it means, uh, general principles and policies around that. Um, we're going to talk about some best practices around record retention and, dis and destruction and some of the factors to consider. I am going to talk a little bit about litigation holds. I think you guys are probably pretty used to implementing those now, so I'm not going to spend as much time as I used to in the whole litigation hold piece, but I think it ties in so closely with document retention that it makes sense. And then at the end, I'm just going to give you some tips around drafting mechanics and some practical suggestions. And again, invite your experience and feedback um, as we go through as we go through the presentation so let's let's go ahead and and dig in and talk first about uh the question of information governance what what does that mean and and again i think it's a you know it's a term a lot of us are familiar with it is you know, it used to be documents nowadays most of our uh, information is digital uh, we live in that world and, and so an information governance policy helps you do several things that are important uh, for the company. The first and maybe most important is <clears throat> having some rules of the road so people know what to do with documents they control. If we're very dependent on documents, we can't have individual people at the company making their own decisions about what to keep and what to destroy. It just, it just doesn't work because you're gonna be inconsistent and one person may be keeping a kind of document and someone else may not. Even more importantly, you may be failing in your obligation to keep critical documents that have to be kept due to some regulation or company, other company policy, uh, or in connection with litigation hold. So you really do need some guidance for your folks as to what uh, should be kept. I do think there is a bigger corporate benefit 
And as we're all trying to be a value add uh, to our business partners, this is an area where I think there is a legitimate need to increase value. And it comes in two parts. Um, one is in connection with the increased information security. Obviously, cybersecurity and cyber threats are a huge issue um, that everyone is dealing with now. And you can do whole separate webinars uh, on cybersecurity. I know it is one of those issues, particularly uh, in a COVID era that keeps everyone awake at night, right? If our systems go down, we will be crippled uh, and unable to work. I think there is a tie in here because a good information governance and good document retention policy will help you know what, where your key documents are, give guidance for how and where those get preserved, and that will help you develop strategies to protect them. So cybersecurity is different, but it goes hand in hand with this idea of let's figure out where our key stuff is and how it's going to be housed. There's also a knowledge management component. Um, and again, that's a popular buzz phrase now about how do we, you know, have our company's knowledge and have it in one place. Thinking about what your core business documents are and how those are going to be housed is also a key piece of that knowledge management. Do you have documents that need to be accessed by everybody in your company? Can they be accessed by everyone in your company? Do you have a schedule for not only where they're going to be kept, but for how long? That's going to, you're going to find that in your document retention policy. So it's a chance to have those discussions with the business folks about what are our key documents? What do we need? And are they accessible? How can we make them accessible? And I think that is important as well. I think the process of developing the policy and in particular the schedules that go with it, that list the different kinds of documents your company keeps, gives you a sense of what the company's bandwidth is, what, what is the range of documents that you have. And I think it's often interesting when we engage in this process, we find documents out there that we didn't know were out there, um, that people were keeping on laptops or iPads or personal devices that might turn out to be important, uh, but no one at the company really knew about those types of documents because they had not done any systematic catalog. Um, and then the last three are, are the litigation ones that I would care most about as your litigator. Um, you do have to comply with regulatory requirements. You don't want to get fined by a regulator whose documents went missing. Um, it can help you with your litigation preparedness. I'll touch on this a little uh, more later, but I do think as a litigator, it's nice to be able to say, okay, what's your retention policy? Where's everything kept? And now we can go pull that if we need to review documents for litigation. And it can avoid you sanctions for improper deletion. So good reasons to have uh, broadly information governance and more specifically uh, your document retention policy. So, so we're going to draft a policy. And I like to start with a stakeholder discussion. This is one area where I think if I had to give uh, some advice. Sometimes there's a sense of someone says, hey, uh, legal department, we need a retention policy or we need to update a policy. It's really old. And so, you know, people say, well, how do I do that? And, you know, you can take one of these sample policies and publish it out. I think that can be problematic, though, because there are a number of other business units and parts of your company that are going to be very interested in that document retention policy. So, Obviously, the business folks care. They're the ones using these documents. And if you implemented, let's say you just said all documents will be deleted after 30 days, you're not going to do that. Uh, obviously, your business folks would go nuts though, saying, you can't do that. I've got, you know, my key contacts with other people. I've got emails with my customers. I've got contracts. I've got a lot of important stuff. I've got these technical specifications that even though they're 15 years old, I use every day. Um, I think having your business folks in on the discussion about what do they use every day? What do they need to conduct their business is really important. And you can't adopt a good, effective document retention policy without some input from the business folks to say, hey, what do you guys need? What needs to be maintained and how long? That's a really important component. If you try to do it in a vacuum, um, you're going to mess it up. You, you may have a policy, but it's not going to comport with the company's needs. And then if it gets actually enforced and implemented, you start deleting stuff, you're going to have business people screaming at you. So, um, I think they are they are really important to have at the table. I think it's also important to have um, your IT folks at the table. You know, they they will be the ones often implementing parts of this policy. If you've got protocols for where stuff gets stored or how long it gets stored, a lot of that gets automated, and you're going to need the IT folks involved at that. It used to be that IT needed to be involved because storage was expensive, and so there were limits on storage. As most of you know, the cost of storage has come way down whether we're talking about 
you know, network storage or hard drives or cloud-based storage, the actual per gigabyte or even terabyte cost is really low and, uh, and keeps dropping. So that really the actual storage cost, the physical cost of storing an extra gigabyte of data has gotten very small, almost negligible to the point that I don't think it's a good motivator for deletion. I think the cost of accessing and reviewing that data, however, is real um, and continues to increase. And it's not just access when I, as your litigator, need to come in and review it. If you have tons and tons of data, the more you add, inherently it becomes harder and harder to find what you really need. So some of that can be addressed through good organization, but there is a sense that the bigger, the huger your data sets, the harder it is for people to get what they need. So I think IT can give guidance in terms of structure uh, and maintenance. Legal is obviously gonna be at the table and you guys are all listening. Uh, compliance, if you've got a separate compliance team, um, you know, they have a role. And again, I think in some ways the hardest part from a legal uh, perspective is determining what regulations your business is subject to. Again, the sample policy provides some reference, but this is really industry specific. And we'll talk about that, but if you are a healthcare industry or a bank, um, if you're dealing with certain types of records, if you're a trucking industry, there are a lot of specific requirements from different regulatory agencies at both the federal and state level. Um, so, and that's something that your compliance people may have a great handle on. Obviously, if you need outside help, a law firm uh, that practices in some of those areas can give you specific guidance. But it's really challenging uh, to figure out what, for, for your specific industry, um, what those regulatory requirements are. <clears throat> so I think having someone from compliance that knows that and can give that input to say, hey, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're, we're, a, uh, we're a bank and we have these Dodd-Frank regulations and we've got to maintain uh, certain documents or, you know, we're, we're, transact we're you know, doing stock transactions and they've got a separate set of requirements or uh, we're dealing with personal health information and we have a separate set of requirements. All that is really key. Um, if you've got a separate, or separate records management, or sometimes now knowledge management team, obviously they'd be at the table too. And then your company may have other people that have different roles. Uh, HR is one that is often at the table because they've got unique sets of requirements around personnel files and have a lot of documents. So you're probably going to want your HR people at the table. And you just need to think in your company, who else is going to have a stake you know, in this decision making um, and part of the, of the game. And this is a diagram that I think is, is particularly helpful um, to me, and it's, it's older now, but it's the Information Governance Reference Model, um, IGRM. And I hope some of you have seen it. I, it helped me appreciate the tension between the different stakeholders in a way that, I, you know, for those of you that are visual learners that learn more from looking than listening to the sound of my voice, this might help. Because it kind of maps out not only who the players are, but what their interests are. So in the, in the center, you've got the documents, you've got some people creating and using them, and then you've got issues around what you hold, what you retain, <clears throat> how you store it, and then what you dispose. And you kind of think of that life cycle uh, for documents of creation, um, holding or retention, and then disposition. And then you, you've got people with different interests, right? So the, the, the business folks are interested in the value of those documents. They want to use it they want to use those uh, to, to create new contracts, to find new customers, to build new products. Um, you've got legal who are concerned about <clears throat> um, the discovery process and litigation hold process and making sure you have compliance there. And you also have this record information management folks who have some of those um, concerns but are also worried about things like some cybersecurity and other issues. And then you've got privacy folks that also may say, hey, we've got to comply with GDPR or something else. We're going to have to modify what we keep to comply with some of these other regulations. And some of those are keep regulations, but some are dismissed. And you can only keep credit card information uh, for so long, and then you must destroy it. So you've got to get input from the regulatory folks. Some rules saying you must destroy, others you must keep. And then you've got IT and their interest more in efficient identification, storage, and retrieval, right, as opposed to concerns about what's actually kept. So I think this wheel is helpful, and you want to make sure you've got those voices heard as you're developing your particular policy and coming up with a balance that works best for you. So as we do a, rec a, a document retention policy, um, you know, these are some of the goals. And I, actually, I think this would be a good time for our first poll, just to get a sense of, you know, where folks are with their current policies 
and, and when was it last prepared? So if you would just answer this, this is anonymous, uh, you're not, you know, your responses aren't going to be shared with anybody else, but you know, is, do you have one that's been done in the last five years, last 10 years, is it more than 10 years old? Um, you don't have to say how, how much older than that, um, or if you don't have a document retention policy at all. So if you could go ahead and, and indicate that, we'll leave that poll up for, for just another minute. I think the fact that you're listening means you care about your document retention policy, <clears throat> but I've worked with folks in all through all four of these, uh, all four of these buckets. So, and again, smaller companies may just not have ever implemented a document retention policy. Ashley, can we close that poll and see where, see where we stand in terms of results? We're going to see what those um, we'll get those results in just in just a minute. Um, you know, I think uh, it is important for us to um, to think about. Let's see. I just want to make sure. I see that the poll is closed, Ashley, but I'm not seeing uh, those results. I don't know if only I can access those or share those with the group. That's a great way to share those polls. Mark, have they been shared yet? I don't see any, I don't see the actual results, actually. Okay. I, I see the note that the poll's closed. I mean, uh, I'm looking and there could be my screen. I've got, oh, here, now I see the results. Let me, here, yeah, I'll leave okay. them here on the shared screen. Thank you. It's, that's perfect. It just took a minute uh, to compile. Um, so we have some quiet people. No answer is the popular result, <laughs> which is fine. Um, uh, of the folks that answered, it looks like the majority have, have done one in the last five years. Um, but we do have a handful in each of those other categories. So, um, and again, I think part of this is company size. Big companies probably, you know, have had a policy in place, uh, particularly after the rule, federal rules. Smaller companies, it's just often not not a priority. Um, so, you know, we're happy to work on them. I do think it's important to update them, especially the schedules, which we'll get to, um, and you'll see in the sample policies I'll circulate. You know, there's generally um, there's generally two components. You've got the actual written policy that kind of sets what your principles are, and then the schedule lists the categories of documents you have and how long you need to keep them. It is important to update those schedules periodically because the regulations that apply to your business change. So you need to make sure you're being current with those current regulations. So um, again, it, that, that's interesting. And, and I think it's useful to, to think about um, some of the big goals, right? I think having a company-wide standard is good uniform guidelines so you don't just have every office or business unit making up their own decisions uh, make sense. That doesn't mean you can't have different rules in different locations, but I think you, you do want a policy so it's not arbitrary or kind of willy-nilly, um, and it gives you a better insight into how to manage um, some, of those, some of those disclosure issues. So. All right, so, you know, I, I'm going to come back to this a few times. I think this is, if you had to kind of capsulize the philosophy of document retention. I think this capsulizes it. And I think you should have a policy statement uh, in your policy. You'll see this in the dry, in the samples. Um, and you're welcome to borrow this or something like it. So, but the basic philosophy is we're gonna retain what we have to retain um, for three uh, purposes. We're gonna retain what we need for business operations, right? That's the fundamental. These are the documents we need to do our business. and. You need to figure out what those are, have your business people tell you what they are, but you certainly want to retain them. So you don't want to do anything that's going to cripple your business. Secondly, you want to um, retain what you have to to comply with regulatory requirements. That's what I'm talking about with the, the OSHA rules and Department of Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act. You've got to keep records of hours work. Um, it's HIPAA. It's all that regulatory environment, some that applies to almost all companies, like the Fair Labor Standards Act, others that may just apply based on the industry you're in. The third reason you want to keep stuff is uh, in connection with litigation hold, right? When litigation is foreseeable, the rules say you've got to maintain documents and suspend your normal destruction policies. But that's basically what you're going to keep. And I think the, the transformative uh, issue in document retention is everything else can be destroyed. And, and that sometimes people pause. There is this bias against destruction, um, but you actually are better off um, you know, destroying it. In fact, there's a Sedona piece called Defensible Destruction that really says destruction of documents that don't meet one of these three criteria is something that's important. Businesses should do it. Um, you'll 
you'll you'll save yourself by doing it. There's nothing wrong with doing it. And I think that's that culture of figure out what we have to keep and discard the rest is really embodies what you want in a good document retention policy. So um, as you do your development, there are a few things uh, to keep in mind in connection with your specific policy. Um, the first is understanding who are your data record holders. Um, this is a concept that may be familiar if you've looked at GDPR and done that work, but who, who are going to be the people that actually maintain documents? Um, it could be your creators, right? But it, it, it may be that creators don't actually have the ability to directly save stuff and it gets saved somewhere else. But you need to figure out you know, where your records are. If you had this theoretical world, for example, where every document was going to be kept exclusively on your cloud-based server, um, it may become pretty easy because everything is in the cloud and then it's only, it's the, your, your data record holders are the people that have the ability to add to or delete stuff in the cloud, which may end up being almost everything. Um, if you had a non-cloud-based central data server, right, you could figure out who are the people that have access to put stuff on or take stuff off that server and they can be your data record. The reality is usually more complicated because most companies allow employees to, for example, save to a desktop. And so if you're saving documents to a desktop and those are company documents, you're now a data record holder. Similarly, if you save to your cell phone, iPad, other device, um, you could be a data record holder. And many companies, virtually everyone's a data record holder. Other companies say, you know, you don't, given your job description, you don't really need to keep any documents. We're not gonna allow you to save uh, company documents, everything has to be done on our server, and that may narrow it down. Um, and the second bullet point is, is one I just covered, which is you kind of need to think about three locations where we're finding documents these days, right? Some are going to be um, on site in your company servers. You may have one in each office, you may have a very central server. Then you, you're going to have what I call off site, which is really a lot of these personal uh, items, which could be uh, laptops or the various personal devices we use now, and that could be a flash drive, cell phone, um, you know, a, a tablet, you know, a real variety of things. And then the cloud is, of course, becoming an increasingly popular place to store company documents. So I think, uh, you know, as you're forming this, this policy or you're beginning to revise the policy and getting input, this is really something important to think about. And again, IT folks may know where most of that stuff is. And, and then the third thing is understanding the regulatory obligations. Um, and, and again, if you've got your compliance person there, or if you're hiring outside counsel, they can help with that, with that component. Um, again, I'm, I'm restating the, the general rule, you know, keep what you have to keep and destroy the rest. Um, I do think I want to touch on data classification because that's something that a lot of companies are doing. And I think the record retention policy is a special opportunity to do that. I'm talking about if you have documents that require certain security clearance to access. Um, maybe it's financial records that only some people can gain access to. Or maybe you're a science or technical company and you've got a lot of trade secrets. Actually, a record retention policy that is grouping your data because you're doing this mapping, figuring out where stuff is, it's a great opportunity to also look at classification and say, we're going to keep these protected trade secrets and we're going to keep them this long and we're also going to assign this level of protection. Remember, if you're going to in, ever end up in trade secret litigation, you have to show that you undertook reasonable efforts to protect the security of that information. And so you can do that in a document retention policy. If you've got a category where you add classification, you may want to cross-reference. If you're doing a lot of classification, you may have a separate document, a policy around classification or classified data. I think those can be cross-referenced um, and work well uh, together. So, and again, the bottom line is uh, destroy those things that you don't really need at the end of the day. Um, a few tips on, on the actual uh, policy generation. If it's a new, brand new policy, I think it's worth saying so. For those of you that either answered the poll and don't have a policy now, I think it's a good idea to say we've decided to have a document retention policy. Uh, and say so. Sometimes this comes at the directive of the board of directors or the CEO or some other policy manager. And I think it's good to get a buy-in um, for the policy by explaining the history. How did it come about? Why? Why are you adopting it? For those of you that are updating uh, your policies, um, I think it is good to, uh, to say, you know, that it's updated. And, and the best policies will have 
an implementation date and a revision date and other information contained so you can go back and see well what was the policy in effect three years ago uh, when we got sued um, and you know have that have that history uh, baked in uh, to the policy so I think if you're changing things and superseding things that's good um, is this going to be company-wide or only applying to certain divisions um, that's important and I think cross references are important all good drafting to make sure you're clearly communicating uh, issues to different to different folks. Um, I, I wanted to touch on here too, you know, as we're talking about information governance, and this comes up oftentimes when companies go and do their document retention. What is your business philosophy around data management? You know, there was a push uh, five years ago, maybe five to eight years ago, around this big centralized data push, and a number of companies offer these giant servers, and the, and the promise was keep all your data housed here and you can control access. It's great from a cybersecurity standpoint. It's great from access. Everyone knows where to find every document. Don't let people, you know, don't use six different servers and six different offices, centralize it. Um, and there is a lot of benefit to that. It can create some logistical difficulty. So, you know, if people can't have local copies or office copies uh, and something goes wrong or there's a connection problem, you could end up crippling your business. Some people like the redundancy of multiple locations. Um, some people find it tedious to have to go to some central server anytime they need something. Um, but think about that. Is that your philosophy or are you very much a, you know, everybody is their own business mode where you can keep stuff on your laptop and keep what you need there and it's all localized. Um, that, that will change how you implement these record, um, record retention policies. And I think that's a philosophy issue. Um, where, again, we talked about the wheel of competing interests. I've listed on this slide, you know, the businesses want to find stuff quickly. That's mainly what they care about. Legal's very focused on making sure that they're preserving what they need and only what they need. You know, IT is going to be worried about how do we manage stuff on all these different devices and know what's there. And then you've got your privacy team saying, hey, you can't have unsecured records out there. We've got some infrastructure schedules that we need to implement. I think balancing those issues is why you've got to have the, the stakeholders at the table when you're doing that work. So, um, you know, and, and let me talk a little bit about um, document retention, which ties into the, the litigation hold piece. Most of you know this if you've attended other litigation hold uh, webinars, but as a reminder, you do have a separate, separate apart from your business interests, you've got a duty to preserve documents when you reasonably anticipate litigation. And there's a whole body of, of stuff on what reasonable anticipation is. There's actually a Sedona paper uh, on this topic as well. Um, but getting a discrimination letter, um, an EEOC charge, both of those can be triggers for preservation. Getting a letter from an attorney threatening a lawsuit that can be sufficient. Getting a draft lawsuit that's not filed is likely sufficient. Um, there's no bright line rule, right? If you get, it's not every customer complaint is not one that reasonably anticipates litigation. It's going to depend on your experience and background and how serious this looks. But if you're thinking, ooh, this could go to litigation, that's going to, you should implement your litigation hold. We'll talk about exact reminders on how to do that um, in a minute. If you don't have a litigation hold, you really just have those other two components, business reasons and compliance laws that dictate uh, retention. So, um, you know, and there are lots of federal record keeping requirements. And I can't cover all of those in this webinar. I don't know all of these. Uh, let, me, uh, let me be clear, too, as a litigator, I spend more time on some of the litigation whole and how do we go in and effectively uh, pull documents for a case piece than some of the regulatory requirements. If you, it, when our firm gets engaged to update these policies, I'm looking at the overall policy implementation and litigation whole piece, but I farm out to my environmental lawyers and my labor employment lawyers and my corporate and securities lawyers and my healthcare lawyers compliance on all these different um, rules. And I've listed some of the most common ones, you know, as in-house counsel, you're probably familiar with these and, and many more that apply to you. That can be a tedious job. You know, we, for companies that have lots of regulatory requirements, we have spent a lot of time mapping out all the applicable ones. Again, you may know those, but it's important to think about those as you design your categories, because they're often gonna set those retention periods you have to keep it for three years, for six years, for 10 years. Most of these statutes have those kind of requirements um, in them. And there's also tax requirements that I don't even think got listed here, where you've got to keep tax returns and supporting financial information.
changed. So it is a challenge. Um, you'll see a lot of the categories and sample policies all circulate, um, but you're going to need to spend some time, either internal time or outside time, uh, getting these updated. And there are there are too many to list, and and it is it's challenging to try. So let's talk about this voluntary period. And I think uh, Ashley, this is a good time for our next poll. Um, if we can put that up here, and I think it's going to you, but I'm going to stick it on the side of my screen so you can see it as well. Um, because we're talking about emails, and we've been talking about emails for a while, but it, although <laughs> although there are new things, and we'll talk about uh, chats as well, emails are still the predominant mode for business communication for many businesses. I dare say most. Certainly as a litigator, uh, the biggest now category of documents I'm concerned about reviewing and producing are emails. So I'm interested in your email. For those of you that have retention policies or, or know what it is, what, how long do you keep emails? And again, your choices here are 60 days or less, 90 or less, some other schedule or longer schedule, or if you don't have a policy or you don't have emails addressed separately, I'm interested in that as well. And let me be clear, some people look at schedules and say, hey, wait, there's no email on the schedule. And that is true. Most document retention is going to be governed by the subject matter of the email. So an email about your environmental compliance program may be subject to some kind of OSHA or EPA or other requirement because of what it talks about. Um, an email that relates to litigation is going to be subject to litigation hold. So I am not saying, and you can't say, you know, all emails are keep or all emails are delete. I do think, however, what you can say is let's have a policy that says if an email is important, you need a folder. You need to put it in a folder related to a customer or related to a compliance issue. Um, and then it will be maintained for as long as we need to maintain it under the schedule. The real question on email policies here, and thank you for showing those results, Ashley, is you know how do you, do you do you have a, a period? And again, it's interesting here. Few of you have adopted either the 60 or 90 day deletion. The majority answer seems to be a different schedule. If you if you feel motivated and engaged and want to put in a chat, what if you've got a holding time, um, that's great. Or maybe you just mean different schedule depending on what the email. <clears throat> contains. I, I will say that because email is such a challenge, and a lot of people allow emails to build up. We've worked with a number of companies to have, you know, have an automatic deletion period, some as short as 30 days, to basically force those email custodians to make a decision right now at this time, is this a document that I need to preserve? And so they are making that determination and putting it in the right folder. Um, thanks, Rebecca, for posting in chat. She deletes after two years, so that's definitely a longer, a longer period of time. Uh, appreciate that, and I love the interaction. If anyone else wants to share anything in, in chat, it's good to know there are uh, there are live humans out there uh, listening in. I, I see we've got 108 people on the line, but I, I can't see any of you, so I appreciate the chance to, to have that interaction. Um, so you know, I think it's 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 clear you can have short deletion periods. Um, I also think there's some value around um, having forcing people to make a decision uh, about their emails fairly soon so you're not going back and have to review a bunch of other stuff. Um, thanks, Stephanie Holland, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, I think, for, share, for sharing as well. Um, you know, a one-year period and three years if they folder it. Um, another person, uh, Jeffrey uh, Parsons, has shared 180 days. So it's, it's an interesting range. And again, all of those are longer. And I think that probably reflects the fact that the business folks are saying, Hey, we need emails. They're really key to our business. We want to keep them uh, longer, longer time. So, um, and thanks, uh, Andrew uh, Walsh, for deleting in, in 90 days, but no actual scrubbing. So you've actually got stuff that maybe kept a lot longer time, which is great. Um, so you've got a range of things. I think this is uh, worth talking about here because uh, I think it's an important thing to think about for your policy. So here's some sample language. Um, which, which again leads more on the deletion side. Um, and again, this is this talks about faxes because we still get the occasional fax. Obviously, once upon a time they were critical. In this day and age, faxes are almost you know obsolete. Um, but the idea is, if they're in the inbox, they get deleted and automatically moved to a deleted folder. And and this policy has a multi-step process, and you may have this too, where you move it to a deleted folder, but it doesn't actually go away. And that's to prevent that business person from screaming, oh my God, I was on vacation and you know, lost the email. You keep them 90 days more 
and then they are removed from the deleted file and truly gone. And then under this sample, if it gets archived, it's kept indefinitely. I know one of you suggested to keep it for three years or six years, uh, which I think works as well. Some companies have explored quotas that limit inbox size. It used to be that it was limited due to technical IT limitations where your inbox could only get so big. That has largely been resolved, at least for the big providers like Outlook. However, some companies like the quota just because it forces employees to not have these mammoth inboxes, which frankly are a problem when people leave the company. If you've got 2,000 emails in your inbox and you leave, what happens? How do we know how, what is in that inbox? How do we evaluate what's important, what needs to be saved, what doesn't? It can create a huge burden on whoever is doing the transition. So that is an added benefit of both the quota and some kind of deletion policy. You've got to see what fits with your business. If you've got a policy for a longer retention and it works, I think that's good. I will say, you know, even though they're good review tools, I've spent a lot of my clients' money in some cases reviewing emails that are several years old and involve, you know, individual personal, hey, can we grab lunch? And obviously there's good tools in Relativity and other platforms that'll screen out all your NCAA polls for the last five years and all the other junk. But if you just send an email to someone saying, are you free next week for lunch? That's probably not gonna be very useful or responsive, but people are gonna have to review it because it's not gonna get caught in any of those other big filters. So just something to think about as you're deciding what, uh, what makes sense for you. Um, this is, uh, I skipped over, here's a voicemail policy. Um, and I think we can do another, the next poll I think is a quick voicemail poll. Um, and I, I bring it up here just because you know, some people, I'm gonna think it's on your screens, but I'm gonna put it up here so for those who can't see it well. Do you treat them like emails? Do you treat them differently? Do you not worry about voicemails? Voicemails are a litigator nightmare because it's very challenging to uh, get a sense of what you, those voicemails contain, right? There is program now, some of the voice recognition program uh, will let you, you know, basically convert it so it can read like an email. If those of you have used those, or I've used the Outlook one, I'd say half the time it gets so garbly, it can be difficult. Um, it can be difficult to even understand what the, you know, what the voicemail is talking about. Um, and, you know, I think the challenge is voicemails can contain important information, but they're very hard to review in litigation. So I've seen companies with different things. We can close the poll uh, if we want and show results um, on that. So. You know, I think some folks say, look, it goes into your Outlook inbox and we're gonna treat it the same way. Um, other people don't. I, I think a number, looks like the majority answer here is no special rule on voicemails. Um, that's okay, but I do think you have to decide as a, as a part of your retention policy whether they're gonna be considered records. And, and if so, um, do you wanna keep them? And it, you may make a decision that voicemails are only records if they are separately saved and plopped into a folder, you know, or some other central location, and otherwise they just get wiped off the phone. I think that's a logical um, case in most cases because if you get that key voicemail from the customer saying, "We know you've done a great job on this project, and I really want to thank you," um, you know, you can do that. Um, and I, I think the you know the modern day thing worse than voicemail are are instant messages and chats, and I think that's our next poll. <clears throat> and I think. Um, uh, Molly Dahl shared that th those uh, chats are, are a worse nightmare. And um, I don't know, Ashley, I think I have a poll on instant messages. What's our next, what's our next poll? Yeah, so, you know, a lot like a lot of technology, right, things have changed. The voicemails became really popular, then they got automated. <clears throat> now, I think I agree with Molly um, that, that really the chats and the instant messages are really hard. Our firm uses uh, Jabber, I imagine many of you use that, or there's there's several other um, IM um, items. But I'd be interested if you want to do the the poll, if any of you keep those routinely as part of your document retention policy. And again, your choice is you only keep them if someone actually takes a screenshot and sticks it into some other form, like attaches it to an email, puts it in a folder, um, or whether you whether you have some practice that archives all your chats, um, there, there is functionality that will allow um, that. And so I think that's a good, you know, that's a good question. You may not have a policy. Um, and, and John Nurkin asked a great question, which is what about video and Zoom recordings, right? Here we are in the COVID world. Um, are those gonna be documents? I mean, 
I, and I mean, I mean, I do think those recordings are document meet the definition of documents under most policies, right? They are. If you record the Zoom meeting, um, that's that's going to be a document. I do think you should think about what your retention requirements are around those. And my suggestion is that for the most part, um, you know, those are probably going to be short retention, right? If you're recording it, you're probably doing it so other people that miss the meeting um, can attend it or listen to it. Um, I think you probably aren't recording it for, you know, to keep it for five years to later reference it. Um, and so you may, um, you know, have a policy that says unless it's kept somewhere else, those recordings get deleted um, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I do think there may be times though where you have a key meeting with a client where maybe in the old, you know, in the pre-COVID days, you'd have an in-person meeting and a minute taker and circulate minutes. Um, you know, you may, you may want to do a Zoom recording for that. You may find that you can still do minutes, obviously, in a Zoom. You may find that minutes are a better way to record it. I know for some companies, HIPAA concerns create issues around Zoom recordings, and so they turn it off. Um, I think that is another company issue, but again, John, it's a great question because it's something that each company's got to decide. Do we think these Zooms are important from a um, business standpoint? Generally, you're not going to have regulatory requirements that are going to mandate uh, keeping Zoom. And unless it relates to pending litigation, you're probably not going to have the litigation component. So the only reason to keep those video Zoom recordings is a business necessity. And so that can be uh, company specific. Um, so back, let's close. Yeah, we've already, thank you. We closed the poll while I was answering that question. And it looks like, again, most of you don't have a policy on on IMs, I know Molly shared um, that you know the Jabber messages tend to disappear if the employee leaves, if that login gets disabled. Um, again, you, most of the time, I don't think you need those, right? That to me, Jabber is a substitute for swinging by the office and saying, "Hey, you know, what's the status on that paper? Or what did you do over the weekend?" There's a lot of non-core stuff on most IMs. Um, obviously, it could be abused, right? Sometimes people put stuff in IMs that they don't want to put in an email because they know it's ephemeral, uh, so they don't do it. Same thing with text messages on people's phones, right? Are those business records? Sometimes you might have a really critical exchange with a customer via text message, or they may accept the contract via text message. You may want to keep those, but I think a lot of it is more similar to phone calls, which are not routinely recorded and not routinely preserved. So if it is feels like a call or feels like a... Uh, a swing by the office chat um, that a lot of Jabber feels like. I don't think those generally need to be preserved, but you've got to decide in your company uh, what the right answer is and what makes the most mo most sense. So, all right, let's move let's move beyond uh, voicemail and and talk about destruction. Um, again, I think if I had to you know give you a takeaway for today, the fact that it is that destruction of documents is not a bad thing. People hear shredding or destruction or, you know, and they get images of Nazi book burning and some you know, you're, you're destroying the, the evidence that your company is evil. It's just not a fair um, representation of most corporate destruction. You know, getting rid of things is good. You, in the old days, you used to always destroy stuff that was at a warehouse, um, except for a very small number of things. Things had an expiration date, right? You didn't keep stuff in warehouse for 50 years, 100 years. It's too expensive. It costs a lot of money. Um, so companies routinely destroyed paper records in an era of paper. And you usually, you might have a box or two of foundational records, stock certificates, articles of incorporation, but they made deeds to land. There are a few other things that a lot of companies do put in the keep forever bucket, but it's a small number of documents. What's happened is since, since warehouse space is no longer expensive and all these stuff is, is kept electronically and very cheaply, companies have begun to go into, eh, just keep everything mode. And my, my submission is that that can be unhelpful because if you get sued, you may have a burden to go and look through all that stuff. Um, you may have compliance stuff that says, hey, you should have been deleting stuff. Um, and I think it's a bad idea. So actually, a, a policy that really deletes stuff is good. Don't make the mistake of having a policy, though, that says you're going to delete stuff and then keep it. Um, I had a, a very public patent trial here in the Western District of North Carolina a number of years ago. Um, involving some patents around online lending. And the company in question had had said they would delete stuff, but then the owner said he wanted to kind of keep an archival record of everything. So they had backup tapes back from the very beginning of the company. That turned out they had all emails on all these old backup tapes. And there were two problems. One it was super expensive to restore emails from these old backup tapes. I think they spent in the neighborhood of $100,000 restoring. So that wasn't 
that was bad because they were not designed to be readily retrieved and they had to spend a lot of money to get the backed up dates. Even worse, they had to spend money on lawyers to review all those emails for responsive stuff. And even worse, they were really damaging emails <laughs> to the company in those old records that showed um, stuff that was very relevant to the case and ended up having a direct impact on the dispositive motion. So they spent a lot of money to find old stuff that ended up hurting them. And I, I just think that's, that's the worst case scenario. And to me, that's an object lesson. And go ahead and destroy it. If you, they didn't need any of those old emails for their business operations. Um, so they kept, but they kept them just because they thought, ah, maybe we'll need them someday, and it ended up really hurting. So I think being thoughtful and deleting makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of cloud details. I know many of you are using the clouds. Hopefully, you've got good cloud contracts with good SLA service level agreements. Um, I do think you want to use reputable cloud providers, right? You don't want to rely on someone where the stuff's going to go away. And you do need to have the ability to delete even in the cloud, right? To comply with all the things I've been talking about. And sometimes that's something some cloud providers are not as good about. They keep multiple copies. They're not really sure what has been deleted. I think it's worth reviewing those contracts and thinking about that as you're doing your document retention policy to make sure you're on point. So um, I do want, let's put up our last, uh, or last or next to last slide, uh, uh, polling, I'm sorry, polling question, Ashley, around litigation hold. Um, and you can select all that apply on this one, so it's a multiple choice. Again, no wrong answer. Um, but you sh I'm sure you are implementing litigation holds unless you're one of those companies that's never been sued. Uh, and good for you if you're in that bucket. Um, but a lot of different people implement them now, right? You may do it as the in-house lawyer. You may ask me to do it as your outside litigation counsel. You might use a third-party provider. There are a number of companies now that do automated litigation hold implementation. So go ahead and answer that poll uh, if you don't mind. Um, and, and once we get some results, we'll, we will share that. Um, again, I'm going to be fairly short on this um, because I think most of you know the litigation hold process, uh, but it does tie in, and some companies put litigation hold right in their document retention policy. If not, you probably want to cross-reference a separate litigation hold uh, policy. But I think that's one of the main goals. So. Um, I think, you know, we know the rule, right? Litigation is reasonably foreseeable. I just want to remind you that things like an agency trigger uh, can govern it. Um, and it does look like you guys are taking the laboring ore. None of this group of 100 uh, is using third-party providers. Seven of you are using your outside counsel, but the vast majority, looks like uh, 38 out of 97, are implementing it yourself. So you, hopefully you're familiar with that process. It's, it's one of those jobs. Um, and you know, and you're you're doing it, and the purpose is to do that, throw that off switch, right? I think the thing that some people forget about in the whole process is it's not just sending out an email. And I will send you a sample litigation hold. Those of you that are implementing it probably have your own forms. I think figuring out who to send those hold notices to, though, is the thought piece, right? That's what you really need to do as a litigation counsel. Who are the key players that might have documents that I need to preserve? That's really where you need to probably do some interviews unless you know your folks really well and say, okay, if this is an EEOC charge, who do I need to contact, right? It's going to be their manager, but are there coworkers that might have relevant stuff? Is there someone in central HR that may have access to um, personnel file stuff or, or employee reviews or other information? Is there comp information I need to preserve? Go through the list, you know, who has it? And simple claims, it may be a handful of people. If you get notice of potential class action, you got to have a lot more thinking to do about, okay, who, who might have information relevant to the class action? Do I just want to preserve with respect to the named class plaintiffs? Do I want to try to preserve for the whole class? What's going to be involved? Are there company level issues? You know, it's, it's a process and, and it's one requires some real thought. So I think interviewing custodians about what they have, um, thinking about your IT systems is good. There was a phase where um, in all big lawsuits, the first thing the other side do would be to depose the IT custodian <clears throat> to identify documents and find out where stuff is, how it had been maintained. Um, in my experience, that has dropped off and is only rarely done. Typically, it's done where there's become some issue around spoliation or failing to implement um, you know, a proper litigation hold. Um, but I do think it's worth remembering that that is a, a discovery avenue that's available. Right, they can, they can actually um, do that, and so it's worth 
figuring out who they may be. Um, I think if you're doing it yourself, it's great. I think coming coming at least nominally from the most senior official is a good idea. Um, you know, have it come from the general counsel, even if it's an AGC or a paralegal that's actually compiling the list or editing it. I think the authority of that and the need to comply is good coming from someone senior. I think a broad definition of documents is important. Um, an identification of categories for attention is important. And a time frame. Um, how far back does this case go? Are we looking for documents over the last year, month, three years? Um, that should be in. And then some contact in terms of who to call. Um, I think you know part of that, my standard hold says if there's someone else that has documents, let us know. Um, I think some kind of written acknowledgement is also really important. You know, used to do an actual signature, sometimes an email response saying I acknowledge is good or keeping even a checkbox that they've opened the email, you know, can work. Um, reminders are good. And I think if you're doing a lot of litigation holds, some kind of automated tracking, whether you delegate it to a paralegal, someone else on your staff, is important to make sure that not only have you sent it out, but people have actually acknowledged receipt and have done so. Again, this is less common now, but the idea of an IT person that can testify about the hold is something that happens. Um, I do think too on litigation holds, you know, I think there's a trend towards central collection at the hold stage because storage is so cheap. What do I mean by that? That means where you go out and you say, okay, we have this EOC charge. Rather than just send an email out, sometimes instead of sending an email out saying, please keep these records, in-house counsel will often say, send me all the documents that relate to the termination of Sally Smith. And then you will set up a Sally Smith litigation file there as part of the general counsel's office where you can gather all the documents. And now, um, it used to be logistically challenging with storage. I like that though, because if it's in one place, you can then send a link to that or a copy of that to your outside counsel if you do get sued. And now I've got all the documents in place or I can load them into relativity. I can review that. I can do an early case assessment, which is really useful. Um, so I think that's often better. You, you comply with your requirements by telling people, hey, keep everything and don't delete it. But getting it gives you a chance to make sure you have it. Then you don't have to worry about, oh, someone didn't get the memo, or yeah, they said they delete it, but the computer crashed and it's all gone, which is probably an excusable event that still can leave you missing key information. Um, so I think there's actually comforting gathering. Again, one is called hold in place. That's the traditional mode. The other is gather, uh, essentially gather and hold there. And you can, you can gather it without reviewing it. Everyone's worried about cost. You may not want to spend time with either you or your outside counsel actually going through that. In fact, until the lawsuit's filed and you get ready to do discovery, you may not even need to give that to your outside counsel. You can say, we've got it, it's on our server, and you know you've complied with your obligations. So think about that. If you don't do that, I think see that as a trend that I think a lot of people um, are using now. So I want just a quick review as you're doing your litigation hold to think about the various places stuff are. I've already touched on a lot of this. Um, but the biggest issue is personal devices. You're gonna check your laptops and servers and other company level resources. And again, think about databases too, if they're deleting things like Salesforce or other stuff in today's world, those databases are often as or more important uh, than other types of information. They can be harder to preserve, um, but, uh, but I do wanna mention those. But the personal device, the cell phone in particular, you know, is a real challenge. And a lot of companies have their own bring your own device policy we have to make, some companies say the cell phone is provided by the company, you're using it for work, and we can access the whole thing. Others say, use your cell phone just for personal business, you know, don't, don't keep any work documents on it. Uh, many, like our firm, use things like Mobile Iron or other software that divides the cell phone into a personal half and a company half, and then have access to the company half for retention policies. Um, but I think you really should think about how you're treating cell phones. Nothing makes employees more anxious than you saying, well, we're going to need to image your cell phone or you're going to need to turn in your cell phone to the legal department because we're involved in a lawsuit, right? They contain lots of personal data. And so there's often a legitimate reluctance to do that. On the other hand, a blanket policy saying we're not going to bother looking at anything on our company on employee cell phones can be problematic because often those do house key information, right? The, the, um, the key email, voicemail, instant message, you know, that either was the harassment or was the inappropriate comment or was the confirmation of the contract. All of that might be on the cell phone device. So I think you have to think carefully about it. Again, some people wrap that 
bring your own device policy into their document retention policy. So um, I'm going to zip through this in terms of emails. Again, I think thinking about how to preserve it. The bigger challenge is often, you know, IM and social media. You know, how are you going to use preserve those? Are you going to collect those when there's a litigation hold? I do think for big cases, we still do go and image either the entire cell phone or the work section of a cell phone so that we have access to that information. Um, but it can be expensive to extract. The imaging process has gotten pretty cheap. I, mean, I figure about $1,000 per device to get an image. Uh, the extraction can be more time consuming and it's still a little hard to review. Social media, obviously another huge area. Are there tweets? Do you have a company Facebook page? Do they need to be preserved? <clears throat> Could they be relevant to the case? You have to think about that as well. Um, and, and documentation and tracking is really important um, to give, give reminders to folks. Um, and remember, litigation holds should go away when the case is resolved. Some people leave them hanging out there forever. That's not really a good thing. And then you potentially have all those documents being kept forever. So I think expiration dates are, are important as well. Um, you, you know that you can get sanctioned. Um, you know, these are just the most common. Um, you, destruction of evidence is sanctionable or even the delayed production. And these can be bad, right? Attorney's fees and costs are most common, but you can get an adverse inference, which can basically lose your case for you or have the whole case thrown out, or you can be precluded from presenting certain evidence. So it's worth paying attention um, to, those, to those issues. I wanted to wrap up with just a few minutes on mechanics and pricing around um, these policies. And this is something of a review of what we've covered here. And if you've got questions too, now's a good time to put them in while we have a couple minutes left. But I think getting the stakeholders is involved. You're generally going to have both a policy piece and a separate schedule. Um, the policy is going to talk about some of these general principles, like what about emails? What about Jabber or instant message? What about your mobile devices? Bring your own device, litigation hold procedures. And things around auditing and compliance. Are we going to check once a year to make sure people are actually destroying stuff? Who's going to be in charge of those compliance? All that gets covered in the policy piece. The schedule piece typically lists categories and retention time. So it would say accounting records, keep them for 10 years. Again, just an example. You know, corporate records, you know, keep, keep stock certificates forever and articles of incorporation forever and minutes of board meetings for five years. Again, it's going to vary. Um, same thing in you know, the marketing stuff. Environmental is often subject to a number of restrictions. HR, you have things like Fair Labor Standards Act. Real estate and title and deeds are often kept for, for a long time or even forever. Legal things, what about stuff in your department? What about deposition transcripts? What about case evaluation memos? What about budgets? How long are those kind of things going to be kept? All that can be drafted. Um, I do think it's worth thinking about what laws apply to you. If you're an international company, do you have to worry about GDPR and international stuff? It is so complicated that some multinationals have one US retention policy and a separate one in either for the EU or even countries. Um, and for big policies, you're probably going to need to involve subject matter experts that can tell you about your SEC requirements and your environmental requirements in these different areas as well. Um, you know, people often ask, well, what's it going to cost, Mark, if we want it reviewed? Uh, again, many companies do this without outside counsel. So if you've got the manpower to do it, um, I don't think you have to involve outside counsel for any of the steps I've listed. Um, if you're simply asking for someone to review and update an existing policy that's fairly straightforward, um, you know, we've done that for a flat fee of like $5,000. Again, I think for those of you that were here before, I think alternative fees are a good fit for this work because it is usually fairly routine. A lot of this is done through Womble's GC Solutions team. If you need a new policy or more of an overhaul, you know that might be a $10,000 uh, request. If you want us to either attend some committee meetings, work on really long preservation schedules, do kind of a full compliance review, you know that might be a $20,000 project. And again, you know I would talk to your outside counsel about what the scope is and come up with the pricing that everyone's comfortable with. I give this just as a guideline. Um, to give you a sense of what you might be investing to get uh, outside counsel help uh, at different levels. So, um, you know, I think we are living in an electronic age. Um, I did want to get to the resource page. Again, I'll send you the sample policies and litigation hold. Here's some articles. I wrote one on, on destruction in cloud computing uh, now several years ago. 
Uh, but Sedona has a lot of publications. I was going to attach them, but the publication thing says I should supposed to just provide the link and you can download it. You have to provide an email address, but it's all free. All the Sedona publications are free. Uh, ARMA also has some resources as well as data management at Harvard. So I've, I've hit the one o'clock hour. I do see a, a question very quickly on COVID-19 records. Um, and I think you should keep those. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Trish, uh, Ray, for that question at the end. Um, you know, you may have, there's a lot of litigation coming in COVID, over 3,400 cases filed so far. I think the records of what you're doing for safety are really vital. So I, I do think you should keep those COVID-19 records, proving your compliance, because there's a fair chance you'll be sued, um, maybe workers' comp, maybe negligence, maybe customers, maybe employees. Um, I, I think keeping good records that are organized showing uh, that you've been thoughtful about COVID-19, you've done research, um, would be great. And the slides will be circulated uh, after, as well as the resources that I mentioned. Um, I want to respect everyone's time. I know how busy you are, so thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer specific questions. If you just shoot me an email, uh, you've got, I think you've got my contact information. You can look me up. I'm happy to talk offline uh, for free on anything I've, I've talked about. Just give me a buzz. I also love human uh, direct uh, communication. So hope this has been helpful. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to present and share with you today. Uh, please be safe uh, and, and mindful uh, where you are. I know these are challenging times. Um, thanks for this opportunity and look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully sometime soon.